Chapter 30, Soft Tissue Injuries. Let's talk about what is soft tissue to start off with. It is everything on the outside of the body. Um, it is the skin, the fatty tissues, the muscles, the blood vessels, connective tissue, all the membranes that hold everything together, our glands, our nerves, pretty much everything but the bones and the liquid in the body. So major function of the skin is it serves as our protection, keeps the bad stuff out. It also helps regulate water balance by uh, retaining fluids or releasing fluids through sweat. It controls our temperature by releasing fluids and causing evaporation. It controls how much fluid by excretion, um, and then it is shock absorbing. It keeps the injuries from being even worse than they could be because of the layers of the skin and the uh, uh, the fatty tissue underneath. So we've got the layers, major layers of the skin, the epidermis is the outside layer. It's the mostly dying or dead skin cells that flake up, at, flake off as we go. The dermis is where all the action happens in the uh, skin. It's where our nerve endings are, the hair follicles, our blood vessels, our capillaries. So our sweat glands, everything kind of lives in the dermis. In the subcutaneous, that's where our veins and nerves are. Uh, the arteries, uh, it's a fatty tissue that kind of goes around it. So that's where, uh, or, or kind of help us understand how deep the wound is and what could be impacted by the soft tissue injury. We use the basic classifications for wounds as open or closed. Open is there's a break in the skin, closed is there's not. So let's talk about the closed wounds. There's no pathway to the outside, so uh, everything underneath it can be damaged, but you don't have leakage of fluids or blood to the outside. These can be minor from just a simple bruise all the way up to major life-threatening injuries of severe bleeding internally uh, that cannot be stopped by uh, anything we have in EMF. Simple uh, soft tissue injury that is closed is a bruise. I'm sure everybody's had a bruise at one time. Hematoma is very similar to contusion, but has more tissue damage and larger blood vessels. It's where you actually get some swelling because you've got blood leaking into the interstitial tissue. Closed crush injury, the force is transmitted to the internal organs. So you have a, a impact to the outside it causes crushing or damage to the inside. That's where we went over the difference between solid and hollow organs in the abdominal cavity. The solid organs will bleed and cause shock. The hollow organs leak into the body cavities and cause sepsis, which eventually causes shock. This is kind of an overview of what they look like. You get your contusion or break uh, with the swelling. Got ruptured. Uh, <clears throat> hollow organs leaking into the internal cavities where you've got a laceration of uh, the blood vessels on a broken bone. Crush injuries causing more tissue damage or a solid organ that's damaged bleeding into the abdominal cavity. <clears throat> when we see bruising on the exterior of a patient, that means there is a high potential for interior bleeding and bruising. So we need to be very cautious with these patients. Uh, consider the mechanism of injury. Do they have enough force to cause injury to the interior? Sometimes our crush injuries are harder to work with because you can't see what happened inside. If you get bleeding inside of the body, you can put pressure on other body parts by filling up voids that do not have the capability to expand. Uh, within the muscles, there's different fascia that keep the muscles, keep the blood from uh, escaping when it starts to swell and that causes more problems for us. As with any bleeding or potential bleeding in injury, you need to have your standard precautions. Always do your ABCs. That's our high priority there. Get that taken care of. Be aware of potential for shock. A fractured femur from the tissue damage inside can actually cause enough bleeding to put the patient into shock. So one fractured femur can bleed up to a liter into the interior of the thigh. So there's, there's high potential for shock for internal bleeding. If there's a break, potential break, or pain to an extremity, splint it. If it hurts when they move it, tell them don't move it and put a splint on it. 
Payne is an excellent splinter, but we can use uh, any other devices, and we'll get into that on musculoskeletal injuries. But keep the devi- keep the uh, body part from moving, which could cause more uh, tissue damage. Look for vomiting because of the chain, the possibility of bleeding into the digestive system, or the activation of the fight or flight because of the injury and causing more uh, nausea and vomiting. Always be aware of changes, monitoring at least for every five minutes. Sometimes an ice pack will help uh, reduce the pain and swelling. If you've ever had a, a, a twisted ankle or a, a, a bruise, you put ice on it, it feels better because you reduce the pain, the, the nerve endings are numbed, and you release, reduce the swelling, which is causing pain. So let's talk about the open wounds, things that get into the body and causes a breach in the skin. So we have different types. We have the abrasions, lacerations, penetrating trauma or punctures, avulsions, and amputations. Other types of uh, open wounds, crush, open crush injuries, bite wounds from animals or uh, people, blast injuries, or high pressure injection injuries. A friend of mine was cleaning a paint gun with paint thinner and uh, activated the uh, trigger and actually injected himself with paint thinner. That was a pretty serious injury from uh, some type of uh, high pressure process. Always use your standard precautions. Make sure you have gloves, maybe a gown, protective eyewear, face shields, a lot of your EMS jackets that you get issued have a blood barrier in there, so you can uh, wear that as your protection, but somehow keep the blood off of you, and keep your skin in good condition. If you've got cuts on your skin, or nicks, uh, any, uh, anything that could cause an opening, you can get blood into there and cause you an exposure. Uh, so any t- if, try not to shave right before you come to class or come to go to work and then you don't get uh, blood on the nicks that caused by shavings. Always do your primary assessment. <clears throat> Mental status, airway, breathing, circulation, and as part of circulation you're looking for severe bleeding. If you find severe bleeding, take care of it right away. Stop the bleed. You want to expose the wound, clean the wound. <clears throat> Get the dirt off of it, get the glass out of it, whatever you need to do. Control the bleeding with one of a few steps we're going to talk about. <clears throat> if you have serious bleeding, give them treatment for shock, blanket, high flow oxygen. And then try to keep everything clean so we don't recontaminate stuff. Bandage the dressing in place after the bleeding is controlled or to try to even even try to control it there. Keep the patient calm and laying still. Make sure they know you're taking care of them and that you're trying your best to take uh, stop the bleeding. And keep their pulse rate down if you can, because the harder the heart beats, the faster things bleed. So let's talk about uh, some specific types of open wounds. Abrasions and lacerations. Big thing here is uh, try to keep the wound clean and dry so we don't uh, cause any more uh, infections. Direct pressure. Just take your gloved hand, piece of gauze, and put pressure right on it. As you hold pressure, check pulse, motor function, sensation, distal. Document what you find. If you have penetrating trauma, try to find out what it was that caused the injury itself. Was it a a pocket knife or was it a a butcher knife? Was it an ice pick? If it was something long enough to go through the body, is there an exit wound? If it was a projectile, was is there an exit wound? Sometimes with uh, projectiles that go through the body, they hit bone. They will break apart when they hit the bone and cause a cone shape uh, injury after the impact. It will also break the bone. So it's a lot of a lot of uh, guesswork, a lot of using your uh, knowledge and just uh, 
kind of predicting what may be going on inside the patient. Reassure the patient you're going to take care of everything. Always look for more than one wound. If something went in, that's a chance it came out. Just because it doesn't come out, that doesn't mean they're okay because now they've got more injuries as it bounced around through the body. Get your BLS in place. Get them to the hospital as quick as possible. Use your local protocols on spinal motion restriction. Uh, here in El Paso County, if the patient has penetrating trauma and no neuro deficit, we do not do spinal motion restriction. Uh, we do not. We figure that if it had, if they had damage to the spinal cord, it would be evident. If it's not, then we just uh, protect them uh, as needed. Now, if the injury is close to the spine, you're going to use your little common sense and uh, probably be have some protection against it. But uh, make some good decisions there based on your local protocols. And then transport to the appropriate facility. Here's an il illustration of what happens when you go in. Entrance room in the back, it hits a rib once it goes inside, bounces down, and comes out the front through the liver. So now you have multiple organs da damaged um, through the process. Looks like you got a lung and a liver on this one. So that's a that's the double whammy on this guy. Here's a gunshot wound to the the lower abdomen, lower ch upper abdomen, lower chest. Treating impaled objects. Something goes into the body, but it stays there. Do not pull it out. It is plugging a hole. You want to leave it in so we don't uh, cause more problems. If it is too big to transport with the object still in, your local firefighters will help you reduce the size of it really easily. They have cutters. They have torches. They have all kinds of stuff. Expose the area around it. Control the bleeding with direct pressure. Do not push the object in, but try to stabilize it from all the different sizes, sides with bulky dressings. Keep it in one place so it doesn't move. Put uh, dressings on all the way around. If it's coming through the body completely, stabilize both sides and try to transport the patient in a position that is safe for them. Secure everything. Treat for shock. Transport to the appropriate facility. There are times that we have asked a surgeon to come to the scene to help remove the object or help stabilize the object. That is something you'll have to work with your local protocols and see if that's an option for you. There's a picture of it stabilizing the object. Gauze pads on both sides to keep it from moving around and bouncing. We want it to stay in the body so we don't have a bigger hole coming out. And then wrap it up so that uh, everything stays in place. If it's in the oral cavity and it's causing airway obstruction, airway comes first. So we're going to remove it. If it is stuck where it's not coming out, you leave it there. You treat the bleeding as you can. But we want to protect the airway. So this is one of those judgment calls you're going to have to make. Examine the wound both in and out. Can you pull it out without causing more damage? If not, leave it in place. Um, it's plugging up a hole as long as it's not blocking the airway. But if it's blocking the airway, now you've got to make some decisions for your patient's life. Here's an example of the pencil in the cheek. If you pull it out, now you're going to have more bleeding. How far up into the jaw or into the mouth is it? We're going to have to pay attention and try to... Uh, Try to figure out what's going on here. And position the patient so you allow for drainage. We don't want to block the airway, so we're going to try to keep them uh, stable. Monitor the airway, dress the wound from the outside, give them oxygen if you need to, and get them to the appropriate care facility. Anything stable uh, impaled in the eye, we want to stabilize it where it is. A cup is a great device to put on there or make a little donut out of your gauze. All kinds of options there. But what you want to do is keep it from moving. The other thing you need to pay attention to is bandaging both eyes. We are not lizards. If you move one eye, the other eye moves. So we want to keep both eyes from moving. So we're going to stabilize the object and cover both eyes so they're not moving around as we go. 
Here's a picture of him stabilizing the object in the eye. Put a bandage over the second eye so now they keep everything straight. We put the cup over. Make sure the object is not longer than the cup before you start pushing the cup on it. Or if you have to, poke a hole in the end of the cup so that you can uh, let the object hang out the end. Also, do not use the object that's stuck in the eye to poke the hole. That's bad form. And use the uninjured eye, give locks, uh, lots of oxygen and transport, and reassuring them that they're not going to be, ho hopefully not blind. Avulsions are a ripping of the skin away from the body. Uh, it's, it's scalping is an avulsion. Give you a good example. The skin. What we want to do is clean the wound, fold the skin back into its place, and control with bulky dressings. If it's torn away or an amputation, we keep it in sterile uh, dressing and keep it moist. If we are trying to keep an organ, such as the skin, salvageable, we want to keep it moist. If we're trying to stop bleeding, we use dry dressing because we want to suck the plasma out and help the platelets clot. So saving tissue is moist, stopping bleeding is dry. Control the hemorrhage. If you have to, use a tourniquet. Make sure you're saving the patient over the, the body part. Amputations. We want to put that on ice, but not directly on ice. Wrap it in a moist gauze, and then stick it in a bag of ice so that it uh, stays nice and cold. They have a really good history of reattaching body parts. Uh, there was a kid out of Michigan that lost both arms in a farming accident several years ago that they reattached both arms. So bring the the uh, body parts to you to the hospital with you. Make sure you label them so we don't get them mixed up with the right the wrong patients. Put it in the sterile dressing. Put it in a uh, a plastic bag. Keep it cold. Stop at a local 7-Eleven, get a bag of ice if you need to, but we don't want to fr get a frostbite, so keep a little gauze around it so it doesn't get too cold. Genital injuries. We need to make sure we are uh, controlling the bleeding, no matter what. Preserve the evolved parts. They can reattach anything that's been di dis uh, dismembered. So bring uh, everything to the hospital with you. Use professionalism. Uh, be aware that it may be an assault. This is not one of those that it happens randomly unless they're driving down the road and someone has a seizure. But it could be more of a uh, uh, assault like a Lorena Bobbitt. All right, let's, let's talk about burns. Burns involve more than just the skin. So we could be um, surface of the skin, which is sunburn, down into the dermis, subcutaneous, and down into the muscle. Things that cause more damage for burns are uh, if it involves the respiratory structures. As the skin gets damaged, it starts to swell. The swelling causes difficulty breathing. Uh, the other thing to be aware of on burns is they are nasty looking. Don't let them uh, distract you from the other injuries the patient may have. Maybe they were in a car crash and got burned. So look for all the other distract the other injuries that may be there on top of the burn. When we're trying to find out what burn is what, we're looking at what caused it. We're looking at uh, the agent. Was it water? Was it steam? Was it electricity? Was it chemical? How deep is it? Does it go through the surface of the skin? Does it go down into the uh, epidermis? Or does it go all the way through the subcutaneous down in the muscle? And then we're looking at severity. How much of the body is burned? So agent, we're talking about chemicals, electricity, hot water, steam. What is the source? Try to get as much information as you can about that. Uh, bystanders, patient information, just what you observe on the scene. And then these guys that really like to de define flames and fire, 
on almost every scene you go to, ask the firefighters what the source of the injury is. They will usually know what kind of fire it was that caused the injury. We have the superficial. Everybody's had a sunburn at one time. That is a superficial injury. That's just reddening of the skin. Uh, when it starts to blister, that's partial thickness. That's when it's getting down into the dermis, causing uh, some fluids to leak into the tissues. And then when we have full th thickness, it goes through the dermis into the fatty muscle tissue below. It's black and charry, like you've uh, had it on. It's 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 well done, and it's it's not good for your patient. The good thing for the patient is that the center area that has the full thickness, it's probably burned through the nerve endings, so it won't be painful. The painful part will be all the uh, second uh, partial thickness wounds on the sides of that full thickness. That's where the nerve endings are still intact and they'll be feeling pain. So superficial used to be called first degree. It's only the dermis. Uh, partial thickness is epidermis. is burned through. You got dermal t dermis damage. Very intense pain. Reddening, blisters, modeling. Looks pretty bad. There's the superficial burn on the redneck here. This is your partial thickness. You notice the blistering around the belly. There's another blistering type of wound on the shoulder. Full thickness goes through all the skin. It's black, charry looking, black and white patches. Uh, it's not, it's, it's tissue, pretty much debris, uh, destroyed all the tissue over the muscle. This is a full thickness burn. You notice the black patches there, the skin's falling off in certain areas. Things you want to kind of consider is the uh, source. We talked about that. The body region burned. Face, very high priority patient. Uh, hands and feet because of the nerve endings, the dexterity needed to survive. Um, hand, hands and feet are very... Uh, very high value uh, body regions and genitalia because of nerve endings. So anything to those is a high priority. Depth of the burn, was it partial thickness or full thickness? Extent of the burn, how much of the body part? The age of the patient, under five and over 55, do not have the, reaction, uh, the uh, normal reactions to burning in the healing process. Or maybe they had the uh, comorbid uh, injuries or illnesses. The same thing we've been learning about COVID. If you've got diabetes, COPD, these things that make COVID worse, they make injuries and illnesses worse too. So now if you get a burn and the patient's a diabetic, they increase their risk factor of long-term complications. To estimate the severity of the burn, we're going to go with the rule of nines. It's kind of helping us establish how much of the body is burned based on percentage of body surface area. We divide the body into nine main areas. Each one is 9% of the body. So in your textbooks, you will have pictures of this or you can Google it. There's all kinds of sources for the rule of nine. But think of the head is 9%. The right arm is 9%, the left arm is 9%. The upper chest in the front anterior is 9%, the belly is 9%. In the back, you've got the upper back is 9%, lower, nine, lower back is 9%. The front of each leg is 9%, the back of each leg is 9%. And then to make out the 100%, we have 1% for genitalia. So know the rule of nines. That helps you identify what body parts are what. So you see on the diagram here, we've got the rule of nine on the adult. But then when we get to the kids, because the kiddos' heads are twice as big percentage-wise, we give them 18%. To make up for that, we take the legs down to 14% total or 7% on each side. So what you will have to do is say the patient is burned from the waist down. So you would have 18 on each leg, 
so that's 36, and then 1 for genitalia. So that'd be 37% of the body is burned. If you have the front half of the left arm burned, you'd have 4.5%. So practice with that, think of the different scenarios, and add up the numbers in your head. We also have a way to get down a little bit smaller by using the Palmer method. The palm of the hand is about 1% of the body surface area. So you take the patient's hand, use that as a comparison, and you can estimate down to those 1% uh, uh, body surface area. Once you determine uh, the priority of the patient, you want to figure out where they need to go. We need to get that information to our local emergency department. There may be a chance that if you need to move them to a burn center, they'll ask you to transport them directly to a burn center uh, and bypass the trauma center. So you're going to have to work with your lo local protocols to figure out your best options here. Kids, they don't have the uh, body surface or the uh, muscle mass or the fluids to help maintain uh, their response to uh, large burn surface areas, so they get treated a little bit higher category. So what we consider a moderate burn on a child would be considered a serious burn. Specific types of burns for thermal burns. Stop the burning process. Cool the area. Water, great resource there. Cool them off. Making sure the airway is open as we do this and maintaining that airway. If they have any burns around the face or mouth, they become a high priority and take them to the trauma center or the burn center as quick as possible. Complete your primary assessment. Maybe that's all you get on some of these and treat for shock. You're going to cool them off, but you don't want to cool them off too much. So you're going to have a, a balancing act here as you go. Try to figure out the, the depth, extent, and severity. If they have things burned to their skin, do not peel that off. If you can, get rid of clothing and jewelry, but you don't need to peel that off if it's stuck. Uh, wrap everything in a sterile dressing. Uh, if they have uh, burns on their hands or toes, take some gauze and put between each digit so that you can kind of separate those and keep them, uh, keep them uh, more secure for the transport to the hospital. Chemical burns, copious amounts of flowing water. If it's dry, brush it off first with a gloved hand and then flush with copious amounts of water. You'll probably be on scene more than 20 minutes on these burns because you need to flush them before you transport. Get rid of the contaminants before you put them in the ambulance. Once you've got them uh, de uh, deconned, washed off good, Get a uh, nice sterile dressing, treat for shock, and transport. Radiation burns. They get exposed to some type of radiation. Uh, could be uh, x-ray machines. There are some uh, industrial machines. X-ray machines are uh, even more prevalent outside of uh, medical facilities now. They use them in manufacturing processes. So know where they are, know your resources, and uh, treat the patient just like a regular burn, but you want to make sure the hospital knows they were exposed to radiation on top of it. If you don't have the training or equipment to respond to a radiological event, do not go in. Uh, they can continue to burn after they've been de decontaminated. Uh, let's see, treat them just like any thermal injury. All right, electrical injuries. Biggest concern with electrical energy is the danger to yourself. If the patient is still connected to the electrical source, they will transfer that electricity to you as the electricity seeks a path to ground. As the electricity travels through the body, it damages the tissue that it comes in contact with. It likes to find the path of least resistance, which is your the fluid in your body and your nerves. It will travel to ground, so it will come enter your body whatever contact at the electrical source and then go out whatever body parts touching the ground. 
So likely your feet, could be a hand or a knee. It will exit the body. So you have entrance and exit wounds. Because your heart runs on electrical conduct, uh, conductivity, it can cause respiratory and cardiac arrest. Because it causes muscle contractions that are very extreme, you can fracture bones. So people who have electrical injuries can have a large potential of a wide variety of injuries and illnesses going on with them. Patient care, airway, breathing, circulation, be ready to defibrillate, treat shock, and give lots of oxygen. Be aware of spinal injuries and head injuries because of the uh, intense electrical contact going through. Look at the burn sites. Uh, make sure that you're cooling off those burn sites to stop the, any more, any additional burns. Nice sterile dressing and transport to the appropriate facility. All right, bandaging and dressing. When we come across these wounds, we need to take care of. A dressing is any material applied to a wound to control the bleeding and prevent contamination. Gauze, uh, non-stick gauze, quick clot gauze. Lots of options there for dressings. A bandage is anything you put on top of it to hold it in place. Curlex is what we knew, use or conforming gauze. Uh, Coband, which is the elastic tape. Uh, we can use an ace bandage. We, can, we have commercialized dressings and bandages mixed together, the uh, trauma dressings. So we've got lots of options for this. No one is going to be there to judge the, the uh, how pretty your dressings look. They're looking, did it stop the bleeding and can protect contamination? So you put the dressing over the wound. Nice contact. If it bleeds through, put more over. Do not lift the, object, the uh, dressing off. The dressing is where the clots are starting to form, so we want to leave it in place. The dryness of your dressing is what's sucking the plasma out and allowing the clotting to function normally. So we have universal dressings. They're just big and bulky. Uh, call them trauma dressings, uh, ABD dressings for abdominal. You have pressure dressings. These are ones that uh, apply extra pressure as you tighten them on the patient. The, the most popular one is called the Israeli bandage. It's got some extra little hooks on it. So as you put it on, you hook it and pull tight, and it gives you a real good steady pressure on the wound. We also have occlusive dressings. It is typically a piece of gauze that's been soaked in Vaseline. You t it's in a nice foil pouch so it stays moist. You open it up, you throw the gauze away, and take the foil pouch and use that for your occlusive dressing. You put it over abdominal wounds to keep the heat in because the ab abdominal cavity gives off so much heat and the organs will lose heat quick. Any large open neck vein, you put the occlusive op uh, dressing over it so that you can keep the air from going in that uh, vein as it sucks the blood back into the body. And we have open chest wounds. There, if you have a chest, an injury in the chest, you're going to allow the air to come in through the chest cavity into the thorax versus through the normal airway process. So we're going to want to put the open, the uh, occlusive dressing over the open wound. Here's the bandage holding it in place. That's a gauze bandage. Just wrap it. You want to make sure you're checking the PMS before and after or CMS sensation, uh, circulation sensation motor function. Always use your precautions, expose the wound. That's what your scissors are for. Get down to where the wound is. Direct pressure or hemostatic agents, dress to stop the bleeding. Do not remove the dressing once you put it on. It stays in place. Don't get it too tight or too loose. You want it to stop the bleeding but not cut off circulation. Do not cover the fingertips and toes so that you can uh, check that for perfusion. And then tape down all the edges so no one trips on them. That's not, you don't want to trip over the edge of your bandage and hurt your patient more. Here's that self-adhering roller bandage going over multiple times. Get it until it's uh, snug. 
you can see the the fingers are still pink so it's not too tight but we're trying to stop the bleeding and always if you have any questions write them down bring them to class ask the instructor have a discussion and hit the like and subscribe to hear for more of these as we go through the class thanks and have a great night